Okay, everyone, welcome to part two of how to make your website work for you. Um, for those of you who were in the first part, I won't go through, uh, I won't do the who I am and why you should love me, um, but thank you for joining us again. Um, today, we're going to talk about how to create a search-friendly website. That's gonna be the main focus of, of today's session. Um, so that it can meet the goals that we talked about in the first part. Um, if you missed the uh, the first part, I put a link in the chat section to the my my um, recording of it on YouTube. You can just uh, watch that when you have the time. Um, and then there's also there's also an official Google channel on there um, that you can watch the first and second parts of this if you would like. So. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to uh, put them on the chat um, or you can wait till the end and we'll answer them then too, whatever works for you. So um, I'm going to get going here. Does everybody see the presentation okay? Like the, you got the, um, okay, very good. Global survey. Very good. All right, so a global survey recently found that 58% of purchasers were prompted by something that the shoppers saw online. So if your business doesn't have an online presence, you might be missing out on an important connection with your target audience. And it necessarily isn't that you have to have an e-commerce website, but it's important to have brand recognition and you should be um, have some sort of online presence, whether it's with a website, with a Google My Business listing, a social media, or whatever it may be. Um, of course, in my world as an online presence management company, you should be everywhere. So um, in today's climate, it may be that a website or an online store is the only way that you can connect with your customers. So it's even more important um, in the digital community to have that digital community around your brand. So let's just go over a couple things that we talked about during the first part of the class. We reviewed the six characteristics of a great website. We discussed some of the simple ways that we can be effective in each one of these areas. So today we're gonna dive a little bit more deeper into some of these areas. So many business owners know that building a website is an important early step. In fact, a lot of people that come to see me for a website come to me and say, I need a website. And when I say why, they have no idea. They're like, I'm starting a business. We have to have a website. Um, but that's why we talked about goals. Um, a website can be a lot more useful than just a business card or a brochure for obvious reasons. And with some advanced planning, you can create a site that helps your business grow right out of the gate. So how do you want your business to, go, to grow? Well, you need to define your goals. In part one, we talked about narrowing your website with specific goals. What do you want your website to accomplish for your business? And what does a conversion look like for you? A goal depends on your business, but some examples might be building a brand, generating leads, um, attracting employees, making sales, um, re-engaging customers with something like a blog, um, or you can use it to provide customer support. There's a lot of things a website can do for you. Ideally, your website leads the user from one page of useful content to the next until they finally convert. And in part one, we discussed using Google Analytics to better understand our audience and what drives their conversion. Um, building personalized, personalized experiences starts with good data and Google Analytics can help you better understand your audience and the insights their activities give you so that you can have more strategic decisions for your business. Um, you can spend time with your user data and your site analytics to find opportunities to customize the experience for users that drive value for your website. So one of the things that we can do with Google Analytics is learn which search terms and sources drive the most traffic. So to remedy a high bounce rate or a misalignment between your visitors and the website content, um, that you may or may not be seeing, um, you can take a look at what your visitors do when they get to your website um, and where they're coming from. Another thing that you can do is you can see demographic information about your most profitable customers. So you can look for useful ways to segment your users and look for distinct groups that might have different wants or needs or behaviors. And you can better understand the characteristic 
characteristics of your most profitable audiences. So you can also understand what content your audience is most interested in by evaluating your traffic. One of the things that we mentioned in part one is that most people, most local businesses that I work with, when we analyze their traffic, one of the things that we see is people are just coming to their website to find out where they can find them and how they can get a hold of them and when they're open. So that helps us know, hey, that information needs to be front and center on your website, on the, on the main page, easy to find. Now, what does that do? That's something that's not talked about in this session officially, but what that does sometimes when you have your, your hours right up on the top and your contact information right on the top, that can actually create um, kind of an artificial bad bounce rate, meaning people come to your website, they find what they need right away and they leave. Now, is that necessarily a bad thing? With data, sometimes it can look bad, but it isn't necessarily bad. People are finding what they need to call you and make a purchase or do whatever they need to do to reach your goals. So that's why I always tell people, be kind of leery about that bounce rate figure. Sometimes it can look really high, but it can actually mean maybe you're doing something really good on your homepage and getting people the information they need right away, and then they can leave. Um, another thing that I've found too is that if you have a local business that also maybe there's the same business name in like Georgia or something like that, and you uh, you start coming up in their searches, so somebody's looking for, uh, you know, uh, Joe's Auto Shop or whatever, and they end up on your website and they're meaning to look for the one in Georgia, um, so that can cause that bounce rate too. So there's a lot of different things you can look up. You can actually find out some of that from Google Analytics. So. So we'll get further into that here. So how to set up a Google Analytics account. So you're, you are gonna need to be able to access the backside of your website to do this, to put some code in. And if you don't know how, reach out to your website designer. All website designers should know how to do this. So you go to g.co slash analytics and you click the start for free and you're gonna set up your website property and it's going to ask you at some point to log in. Now you'll need a, a Google account to log in. A Google account can be a Gmail account or it can be a, a business account. So you have your name at yourbusiness.com. You can use that as a business account too, or as an account to log into Google Analytics. So once you set up the property in the analytics account, um, your, you can then set up a reporting view in your property, which is certain types of views that let you create filtered perspective of your data. For example, all the data um, that comes in except from your internal company's IP address. So you can make sure that you're not counting yourself as like hits on your website. Um, so finally, you'll wanna follow the instructions to put the tracking code on your website um, so it can properly co collect the data. Now, once you put that tracking code on your website, it starts from that day. It doesn't go back in time to start collecting data. So if you were to install the tracking code today, it's only going to install it from today forward. So you'll wanna wait probably a month to have any good data to really look at. Otherwise, there's just not enough information. So it does not collect data back in time. Um, if you run into problems with where to put your tracking code, um, just go to YouTube and type in something like um, WordPress, Google Analytics, um, tracking code or something like that, or whatever CMS you might use. If you use Squarespace or Wix or whatever, um, Drupal, just type that into YouTube and there's many, many uh, tutorials out there about that. So let's take a look at what Google Analytics actually looks like um, from the backside here. Um, one of the things that they have is called acquisition report and it's an ABC report. It's called acquisition behavior and conversion. And basically it's how you acquire users. Um, it's also their behavior on your site and their conversion patterns. So you can see where the traffic comes from and how certain channels perform. Um, you can use acquisition reports to find out how people are searching for your business, how they're finding your website through search. Um, and, and that's like keywords. So you probably are familiar with that term keywords. Um, we can see what terms people are using to find you and then the conversion rates for different search terms too. Um, you can use this information to drive site content and overall content strategy. Um, you can connect Google Analytics to Google Ads, and then you can um, connect the two to make your ads perform better. Um, if you're presenting on different platforms, check out the attribution model comparison tool, and that's in the conversion section. 
Um, here you can find insights about the path to purchase if they're clicking on multiple ads from different channels. You can also find be benchmarking metrics for different channels by go going to the audience part of Google Analytics. So let's just keep in mind not to get too caught up in certain numbers. Um, instead, we're just going to use them as a general guide and a ben benchmark for your performance against your own account at a previous time. So who is your target audience? Uh, we can look at audience reports for that. Audience reports provides insight into characteristics of your users, such as demographics, interest, geography, language, behavior, technology, and what devices they're using. Um, business owners often have preconceived notions about who their audience members are, um, but you can actually go into Google Analytics and learn more about your audience and see if you might actually have a potential mismatch there. Um, especially when people first start their business, a lot of times they think, oh, we might be appealing to women ages 18 to 30. Um, and then when they start looking at who is actually on their website, they may find that, no, it's actually young men or whatever. Um, so you just never know. And so you can kind of uh, use this to see if um, what you anticipated when you set up your business is still still what people are, what is, you know, uh, the people that are actually coming to your website. All right, so we can take a look at behavior flow reports. Uh, this is a visualized path that users travel from one page or event to the next. And it helps you discover what content keeps users engaged with your site and how to, it also can help you identify potential content issues. So if, um, if, there's a, if people go to a certain page on your site and then you see that so many people are leaving, that's one thing you might wanna check and make sure that page is working because they may have ended up there and then all of a sudden they're gone. Or maybe the links on that page aren't work working or maybe it's creating an error report or maybe it's been hacked or whatever. Um, but that's something to look at. And on this page over here, um, there is, uh, let's see, starting pages. Um, there's a page that ends in jars or something. So, and there's a lot of people that drop off after that. So I might go look at that page and see if that it's still working properly and all the links on that page are working properly. So in order to be able to see a behavioral flow report, you have to be set up and be tracking events uh, before they can actually appear in the report. So the more organized you are about setting up your event tracking code, the easier it is to use the events and pages and the events views in the behavior flow report. Now, when you first set this up and you're new at that, you're probably not gonna be able to you know, do that in depth, um, but just know kind of the more, the more data you put in in the beginning, the, the better your reports are gonna look, the more information you're gonna get, get out. What's the old saying, you know, bad data in, bad data out, right? So the more detailed you can be in your setup, the better reports you're gonna receive. So conversion reports, um, a conversion is a completion of an important business activity. And a lot of people think it might be a purchase, right? But it's not necessarily just a purchase. It can be like a lead. Perhaps you want to get people to sign up for a newsletter. And so that can be a conversion point for, for your website. Um, you may want people to register to, um, be a, a blog contributor or something or a blog commenter or something like that. So that's a conversion. Um, there are, there are kind of numerous things that can be conversions. Um, so in this report, we see this, the which sources drive the most conversions um, on this business owner's website. And for example, organic traffic from Google search resulted in the largest number of total revenue. So uh, the conversion reports help you as a business owner make strategic business decisions like where you would spend your advertising dollars or what social media platforms you might want to maintain with the largest presence. So if you can tell like from the from the link here or from the sample that they show here, um, they the organic search results are their number one search result. So if they wanted to put money into advertising, um, they're, you know, they're not going to go with Facebook. Facebook is number nine, eight or not, eight and nine. So mobile is number eight. Um, so, but even with those two added together, they still don't reach the organic search results. So if I was looking at a report like this, I'd be like, put your money in Google ads. Um, and it even looks like in this case, um, 
Bing search results um, are actually number six. So they're beating out um, Facebook. Uh, yeah, it looks like they're still beating out Facebook, both mobile, mobile and uh, desktop Facebook. So um, the number three that you see on there is, is uh, Google CPC. CPC stands for cost per click. So that's actually advertising on Google um, versus organic results. So you can kind of just see where to put your money and where to put your attention. Um, all right. Okay, so we talked about how important it is for a great website to be organized. Um, even if you don't have a lot of web pages now, your site should and probably will grow over time. So planning how to organize your website now and in the future, it's going to fit the framework of your website to better serve you and your customers. So let's take a look. Um, in part one, we talked about information architecture and designing your website so that your target is, or so, so your website is designed around your target audience. But what happens when you aren't sure what your audience wants? Well, Google Optimize is a tool, uh, g.co slash optimize. It allows you to tap into um, their needs in with real time reactions. You can run experiments and optimize. You can test new website designs, layouts, and content with a subset of your visitors. Instead of relying on instinct and opinion to determine the best page or site design, you can actually run an experiment that tests alternate designs with real world users and gets results that are simple to read and understand. Now, Optimize uses the power of analytics to measure your experiment and uses your analytics goals um, as, as experiment objectives. So what's more is that you can serve experiments to specific groups of users that you've defined in the audience in your Google Analytics um, account. Now, marketers can run experience, experiments on landing pages to increase conversions. Um, publishers can test how different site layouts will affect um, how long somebody stays on the site, how um, social media managers might want to experiment with different sharing strategies or sharing plugins, for example, if people, you know, one of them doesn't work as well. Um, designers can also just test new website designs this way. So, Optimize allows you to run a variety of free tests to customize your website experience for your target audience and to more effectively drive site conversions. Some of your tests that you can run on Optimize include AB tests or ABN tests, which let you test multiple versions of the same web page to learn which web page might best suit your users. Um, multivariate tests are also, they allow you to test multiple elements on a page to see which combination achieves your goal. Um, a redirect test or a split URL test, um, it's a type of an A-B test. It allows you to test separate pages against each other. And with redirect tests, the test variants are identified by a URL instead of a page element. Um, which is more useful when testing two different landing pages or a complete page redesign. So um, you can better deliver personalized experiences with your customers, and then you can immediately launch the winning version of your website from the experience, from the experiment, or you can um, launch a custom experience from the ground up. All right, so how to use Google Optimize? Well, um, there are some examples here that we talked about that show you, you know, how you can change color variations, how you can change layout variations, um, how you can change do different pages entirely to do an A-B test um, uh, or like a split test, they call it. Um, so that's just one example. All right, so obviously a great website is useful. In part one, we talked about how a great website includes useful information for your customers. And chances are that your customers are gonna search for this valuable content using keywords in search engines. So it's important to incorporate those keywords into your content so it will become more recognizable by search engines and more easily found by customers. Um, let me go back to that other slide. So here, I get asked about search engine optimization a lot. And so the way that they word this, I'm going to just change completely for a second. If you want to come up on a Google search for certain keywords, let's say for me, I want to come up for website design Billings, Montana. When somebody types in website design Billings, Montana, I want my website to come up. 
Um, by the way, don't type that in because I haven't done SEO on my own website in like months. So anyways, what I would do if I wanted to come up for that certain key phrase is I would create a page titled Website Design Billings, Montana. And all of the information on that website or on that page, excuse me, would talk about and use keywords that people might type in in order to come up in Google search results. So there's the long and short of search engine optimization. If you want to come up for certain key phrases, you have to have those key phrases on your website somewhere and they have to be prominent. They have to be the name of the page. They have to be a header on the page. Um, there has to be a picture with that in there um, with alt tags or whatever. Um, but that's the key to SEO. Um, you cannot have a, a, a website filled with rainbows and unicorns and expect to come up when somebody types in uh, RV mechanic. You just, that doesn't work. So the content of your website and the keywords used in your website should reflect what it is that you want to come up in Google search results. Um, so that is the long and short of SEO. We'll go into it in more detail, but, but that's, if I could tell you one word of advice, that's, that's what it is. So, um, so here's this tool called Google trends. Um, I love Google trends because it can help you understand what keywords are trending in your industry or in your geographic location, um, over time so that you can more, you can incorporate those keywords into your website content and thus come up in search results. So let's take an example of yoga studio. Um, let's say this yoga studio is contemplating making adjustments to the content of their website and they want to know what keywords would potentially drive the most traffic to their site. Um, using this tool, Google Trends, this yoga studio can compare keywords that they would like to have surface, have surface their website um, and determine which of these keywords are being searched for the most in the area. So they'd go to g.co slash trends, they'd enter in the keywords or phrases that they'd like to compare, and then they narrow down the results by location by clicking on the state or the region. Um, and in this case, we narrowed it down by um, Colorado. And then we adjusted the date to 90 days, and then you can see the results. So um, over here, you can see the um, the search term they, they put in was yoga, and yoga, the search term, has increased um, over the last 90 days um, in the Colorado area. And it looks like they actually, they can, they broke it down by metro. So I'm guessing they probably broke it down by the Denver metro area. But they also used their 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 term, um, the Berkram Yoga, and they put that in there and they could compare and you can see the blue line here, how that really has not changed, that the trend has not changed. Um, let me see. All right, so there is a step-by-step -step, um, comparison how you can actually um, do the trend results there. Um, one example that they use in another seminar that I do is um, a pizza. It, it was an example of a pizza guy, um, a pizza uh, restaurant. And he had come up with this like cool idea for a pizza. And it was like pineapple something. I don't remember what it was. Well, he invented it and he thought it was really, really cool. So he put it on his menu and nobody ordered it. And he was like, well, why, why is nobody ordering this pizza? Um, so he went into Google Trends and he typed in like pineapple, whatever the name of the pizza was, pineapple pizza something. And the trend, it wasn't trending at all. It wasn't something that people were searching for. Um, it just wasn't working. But what he was able to find was that there was a ton of people over the last year and the trend was just going up that was looking for gluten-free pizza. So if he would have invested his money in um, his money and his time into making a gluten free pizza, he actually would have seen sales go up um, versus just kind of running off the seat of his pants, just kind of like, oh, I made this cool pineapple pizza. Um, so if he would have looked at the trends, he could actually see how many more people were searching for gluten free, put that on the menu, and then he probably would have seen an increase in sales. So uh, it's a great way to kind of predict and see what's going on. Oh, so, um, okay, so moving on to the functionality of the website. Um, 
what exactly does functionality mean? Well, in part one, we discussed how different types of website functionality can help customers find what they need more quickly. Um, they make more informed buying decisions and then they connect with your business in new and different ways. Um, now more than ever, because of the pandemic and everything that's going on, you have to consider how you can best connect with your customers remotely. Um, and you should increase your website's um, visibility and your, webs your website's functionality. Um, and what's some of those things that, you know, what, what, what exactly does that mean? Well, too often website creators are tempted to add functionality just for the sake of adding it. Um, but you'll want to make sure that you're always considering the user experience when adding elements to your website. Now, for example, that may include um, something like, well, for one thing, web designers like me, we love to add like cool like gadgets and widgets and whatever to websites because we can. But if, it, if nobody's using them, then they're just kind of taking up valuable space on your website. So let's say, for example, you have a, a pop-up that comes up on your website and it comes up as soon as somebody comes on there and it says, join our news newsletter and whatever. And, you know, it's great. Well, with Google Analytics, um, you can actually see if people and probably the, the company that does your, your mailing software can tell you this too. But you can actually tell if people are signing up for that and using that. And if they're not, then why have it on there? It's just causing problem. It might even be causing people to leave or they might get frustrated with it. Um, it another thing that uh, you, you never want to have videos automatically play with sound or you don't want to have background music in your in your website. Um, statistics have shown, shown us repeatedly that that is a bad user experience and people will leave a site because they can't get the sound to shut off or whatever. Um, I don't know overall the overall numbers uh, for overall website use, but I know with Facebook, as high as 80% of users wa or scroll through Facebook with the sound off. And so um, this is so they don't disturb other people around them or whatever. Um, but you, you have to kind of consider that's probably similar. So you just don't want to sacrifice your user experience in any way. So um, functionality can include things like minimizing the amount of time that a customer spends um, checking out, for example. Um, so with Google Analytics, you can actually follow the checkout process and see if people are abandoning their cart at a certain time. Um, maybe they're, Maybe you're asking for a credit card and you don't have like Google pay or Apple pay or whatever integrated into your website. So that means for most people, they got to set their phone down, go find their wallet or their purse, go get a credit card out and type the number in. Whereas if they have um, Google pay or Apple pay or something like that connected properly, they just hit a button. So that could be something that you could focus on um, in order to um, increase your conversion rate. Um, so, I'm not going to go through everything on here because there's kind of a lot. Um, so functionality, one thing that it notes here is that um, website designers um, like myself, um, a lot of times we want things to look beautiful, right? Um, but you should never sacrifice the look of a website for the functionality of the website. They should, everything should work together. Um, so just be aware. I don't know if one is better than the other, but um, I would say, you know, if your website does not work, it does not function properly, it doesn't matter how beautiful it looks. Um, so don't sacrifice um, functionality for beauty. Let's put it that way. All right. So a great website is intuitive. Um, visitors should not have to think about or struggle to find what they're looking for. Um, the design can have a big impact on whether they stay on your site um, or whether they move on to something else. And so you're going to want to make sure that your website is responsive. And you can use this thing called um, Google Inspector. And it's on Google Chrome. And you can test your website's compatibility with all different types of devices. And so you can go to, you can use Chrome to visit your website and you right click and select inspect. And from there you can, um, you can toggle through and see what your website looks like on different devices. Now, if you're using um, 
a CMS like WordPress, for example, um, you can do this when you're building your website too. Uh, and one thing that you should remember is that 65% of internet traffic, if not more, um, that's just the latest numbers we have, but 65% of internet traffic comes on a mobile device. Um, many web designers sit and design their sites on a desktop computer because it's comfortable and it's easy. But truth be told, you should be thinking about your mobile experience first. So... All right, so here is the juicy part. In part one, we discussed how the Googlebot and the algorithm work to understand your website content and to place your site property in Google search results, kind of like um, it does at a public library with a, a card catalog or index system. Um, so we discussed the concept of SEO and some of the tips for optimization for your own website. And we're just gonna quickly go over those concepts that we talked about again, just really fast here. So. What exactly is SEO? SEO refers to um, the technique to improve your website's rank in Google and search results and attract higher quality and higher quantity of website visitors to grow your online presence. So why is SEO so important? Well, when customers um, use search engines, they're typically looking for a specific product, a service or a solution. Um, they either wanna be entertained, educated or reassured. So regardless, they have a specific need or want and your website may be able to fulfill that. So ranking in search results for particular keywords and topics and phrases can help you connect with your ideal customer. Um, the other thing about SEO that's really important, there are several factors um, involved in SEO. It's not just keywords, but it's also loading time. And you can go to g.co slash test my site um, to see your load times. And it can also give you um, uh, suggestions. It will say, you know, your pictures are too big and they're causing your website to, to load slowly. Or it's... Um, you know, your service slow, for example, or something like that. So you can actually go there, test your website and, and see what, what happens. Um, uh, you're, you're gonna wanna have original useful content. Um, the more original, the better. Um, you don't wanna just copy and paste from a competitor's website. It's not only, you know, fraudulent, but it's, um, it's not going to help you. So um, you wanna include keywords that users would type in to find your pages. Um, and then you also want to have inline links. So, um, especially in the navigation, but just in general too. Um, these are links like, um, if you on one page refer to filling out a form um, on, you know, go to our, um, let's say it's a, let's say you're a pet adoption place and you're like, go to our adoption page to fill out a form for your adoption paperwork or go there for a foster paperwork, whatever, have links directly in the, the text to that page um, so that it's really easy for people. And also creating that links creates a sort of online web and it, it makes those connections. And the more connections your website has to not only within its own site, but also other sites, the better. Um, the smarter Google gets about figuring out what exactly your website is. Um, the other thing that's really important is to include alt tags. And alt tags, um, it's A-L-T alt tags. Um, an alt tag was originally designed um, back in the day, it was designed for um, people who were visually impaired um, to be able to tell what picture was on a website because Google could, you could put a picture there, right? But Google doesn't know, the computer doesn't know that that's a picture of a woman with a dog. It, it just knows it's a picture. And chances are the picture itself is named like image 9532. It's not actually named woman with a dog, dot JPEG or whatever. Um, so alt tags, what alt tags do are they provide Google with information about what is in that picture. So if you are a mechanic in Billings and you have a picture of somebody fixing a transmission, the alt tag for that picture should be transmission repair Billings, Montana. That will help you come up in the search results. Um, that will help uh, people who are visually impaired be able to understand what is in that picture, which is what all takes were designed for. Um, but again, it just help, it helps Google understand what the content on your website really is versus just being named, you know, picture 12. So, all right. Um, page titles and descriptions. That's the title element that um, you'll see. Um, you want to make sure that those are um, clear and they include keywords and key phrases that your audience might use to find you. 
Um, and remember the information architecture that we talked about. It not only helps human visitors, but it helps Google interpret the content of your website um, so that it understands what your website is about. Um, and last but not least, remember to design your site for all browsers. That means Apple's, um, Chrome, Firefox, uh, Edge, whatever it may be. Internet Explorer has gone away. It has died. Um, but Microsoft has the new, uh, I think it's called Edge. I don't use it anymore. But um, anyways, they have that new browser out. So make sure that your your site looks good on all browsers. It looks good on tablets and smartphone as well. So Google actually prioritizes websites that work across all devices. So um, if your website is not mobile friendly, that will be a huge hit against you. So, all right. Okay, so Google Search Console, this is a really, um, a good tool, especially if you're just starting out and you don't, your website has not been up um, for a while. Um, G.co slash search console. Um, search console is great because it helps you monitor, uh, maintain and troubleshoot your site's presence on Google search results. So um, even though, even if you won't be using search console yourself, um, you should be aware of it because um, you may it you can set it up so that if um, uh, Google may find like a crawl error on one of your pages on your website, for example, and it may come back and it may say, um, "Our crawler visited your website on this day and it found like twelve pages, uh, but now we visited it and there's only eleven, so something's missing, something's broken." Um, and so you can go in and kind of like see if a page is missing or maybe you've removed that page so you can tell Google, hey, it's okay, I've actually removed that page, don't count it against me. Um, it, as somebody who focuses on online marketing, Search Console will really help you monitor um, website traffic and optimize your rankings. Um, so it's more of an advanced tool for people who are SEO specialists. Um, but you'll wanna make sure and get uh, signed up for Google Search Console. When I do this for clients, I actually do analytics and Search Console at the same time. I just, I just bounce from one to the other and set them both up um, because they're both different, but they're, they're kind of similar. So um, you can use them in conjunction with tools like analytics, trends, and Google ads. You can connect these so that um, you can kind of get the best. Um, you can use the data more effectively. Let's put it that way. Um, so in search console, you go to the website I mentioned before. Um, you can put your website in and you'll receive day-to-day -day emails if unusually unusual events occur. Um, you can also, if you have a new website, a brand new website that you kind of want to get online quickly, you can tell Google, hey, I have a new website, go crawl it. And um, it will, Google, the Googlebot will go out and, and crawl it. Now, usually a Googlebot within like, I don't know, usually three to seven days will find your website no matter what. But if I have a, a client who's like got an event going on and they want, you know, they just added like six pages to their website, I, I will go on Google Search Console and tell Google, hey, these are up there. I want you to come find them. Put them in your card catalog because I want people to find them. Um, so you can use that for that purpose. Um, Search Console features. You can look at a performance report. Um, and that shows you important metrics about how your site performs in Google search results, how often it comes up, um, the average position in search results. Um, it'll give you a click-through rate and any special features such as rich snippets um, associated with your results. Uh, the URL inspection tool will also give you, uh, it'll check for a specific URL on your website to see the status of how Google search sees that URL. Um, and this, this provides a detailed crawl and an index, um, and it provides serving information about your pages directly from the Google search index. Um, the mob mobile usability report is really handy too. Um, and that will just tell you if any of your pages have any usability problems when they're viewed on a mobile device. Now I will tell you this as a web designer, um, sometimes the mobile usability uh, thing comes back with results and it says like, this page is not, doesn't look very good on mobile, but it's actually fine. Um, so I get some like false negatives off of that. So don't shoot your web designer <laughs> if you get that. Um, it does happen sometimes and it's just, um, 
I, I don't really know why it, it does that actually. Um, I haven't been able to pinpoint that, but it does happen sometimes where it just, it's thinks that certain things are not quite right. And, and when you go and inspect it, it actually is fine. So, so just kind of keep that in mind. So uh, nobody should be mean to their web designer. We work really hard. So, um, all right. So let me just talk about some of the resources, the additional resources. Um, during our first session, uh, we, I went over these just a little bit. And so with these, I'll, I'll, um, I'll take you through. Um, these are some additional tools that Google has uh, that are free. So Google Primer, I love Google Primer. If you ever see me at like Billings Clinic waiting, you know, my turn, I'm, I'm probably on my phone and I'm probably using Google Primer uh, because they are quick and easy lessons that you can learn in, in less than five minutes. And they're like mini courses and they walk you through, you know, um, things kind of like what we, we talked about today. Um, but they also could be things like Google ads or, um, uh, using Google My Business features, for example, um, and just a whole lot of things, um, how to update your hours on Google My Business or whatever. Um, and so it's just a really nice tool. It's really easy to use. And it's really lightweight. So um, you go to the App Store and you just, just search for Primer and it's a green uh, little icon there. Um, Skillshop training on Google, um, that's g.co slash Skillshop. Um, these are e-learning courses that are more in depth, but they actually, you can you can have beginners, they have um, information for beginners, intermediate and even advanced. And there's actually a skill shop that's coming up where um, you can actually learn coding and everything. So you can actually get certified in that. Um, and that's coming down the pipeline. Um, and so, whether you're a beginner or 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 you you know kind of in between, you can actually learn a lot in Google Skill Shop. So, and it's free. Um, Grow My Store is brand new. I have never used this, um, but you can go to the Grow My Store um, g.co slash Grow My Store. You can type in the URL of your e-commerce site, and it will analyze your e-commerce site, and it will tell you recommendations about how to improve your online experience. So give that a try. Um, quick help, this is kind of fun. They're just short videos about how to use some of Google's tools. And so if you are, uh, if you use Google Meet, like we're using today to do conference calls, um, if you have a YouTube channel for your business, if you use G Suite for your emails and other tools, there's a bunch of videos on here about how to get things done. They're usually less than like 30 seconds. There's little quick frequently asked question videos, so. All right, so the Grow with Google program, that is the program that I am a member of. And um, it is it was originally designed for small businesses, but has since expanded to help uh, teachers and students, job seekers, and also coders and developers learn to code. So um, there's kind of a whole plethora of information there, and that's at google.com slash grow. Um, you can see all the partners um, there as well as upcoming classes, just like the one that we're in today. So um, check that website out for um, for more information about the Grow with Google classes. Um, they do have quite a few quite a few webinars um, that are for uh, that are nationwide now. So they used to mostly rely on in person classes, like I've done in Billings before, but. Now they've got a lot of webinars because that's just the world we live in. So, all right. So does anyone have any questions about um, any of the material that we covered in the last two parts? Um, you can use the chat function. You can unmute yourself and just talk to me, um, whatever you prefer. All right. I'm also going to put my email on here. If you have a question and you're shy and you don't want to ask it or you think of it later, um, there's my email address. You can please feel free to email me. Um, I'm going to stop the recording here also.